My name is Leslie Ann Johnson. Welcome to the first in our programs, Preparedness is Key, where we look at the importance of disaster preparedness now that we are in the hurricane season and disaster preparedness as a way of life. My first guests are Mr. Sylvan McIntyre, the Acting Disaster Coordinator at the National Disaster Management Agency, NADMA, and Mr. Hubert White, Manager of Meteorology. It is good to have you both. Thank you so much for coming. Right, so Mr. McIntyre, I will start with you. Now that we are in the hurricane season, but we are an exhausted people mentally because we are still dealing with the effects of COVID-19, as we know. What are some of the basic preparation techniques that people should bear in mind at this time, taking into consideration that we have this additional challenge now with the hurricane season, and it being said that it will be an above average hurricane season? Okay, great. So preparedness now for the hurricane season should, be, should become a, a household activity. And obviously it should eventually become a national activity because we have the threat every year. So just like people prepare the land, the ground, etc., for during the rain season, Corpus Christi coming for plant, planting is similar. That's the kind of engagement and the kind of a spirit we would expect to prevail when the hurricane season is here. People should try to look at their preparedness plans, their little house plan, how prepared are we. You do your surroundings, look at your drains, look at the trees, uh, look at what structure you have in place, whether you have containers that in the event that rain come, you can secure items, your documents and all of these things. It's a good time and, and most importantly, to start a conversation at family levels, at community levels and so forth, so that everybody understands the level of preparedness. It is a common thing to look at NADMA, the agency, and ask, how prepared is NADMA? But the whole preparedness mode starts with individual. And just like I said, it is just like any preparedness activity. You start with the basic things around you, figure out what to be done, who has to do it, what it has to be done with, and how it will be done. Definitely. Thank you so much. Mr. White, Put things in perspective for us. We are expecting an above average season. What does that mean in terms of predictions? First of all, thank you for having me on the program. Well, the focus is for an above average season. And that means we expect more storm than usual. And the average is taking from about the last 30 years. So for this year, we expect 16 named storms, that is, Tropical cyclone in the excess of about 40 miles per hour wind. And um, the average is 12, just about 12. So that's already above average. Of that 16, we expect it to become hurricane that is exceeding 75 miles per hour. And the average is just about 6.4. And of that eight hurricane, we expect four to be major. And the average is 2.7. For, for my entire career, I cannot recall a forecast calling for four major storms in any one year. So that is cause for concern. And there are reasons for it because the Atlantic is a bit warmer than usual. And of course, we have moved out, out of the El Nino, which I would not bother to explain now. It's a highly technical term. <laughs> but what you say, what concerns the public is that we expect more storms than usual. Put it mildly. Um, although we expect most storms in the Atlantic Basin, and we're speaking about the North Atlantic, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico, one of them may or may not affect Grenada. But there's no sense of being complacent. We have to be prepared. We have to be prepared for the worst case. So that's really, as if your program is here, preparedness is key. Mm -hmm, definitely. But if we were to compare Grenada's levels of preparedness, staying with you still, Mr. White, um, during the times of Hurricane Ivan and Emily, what should we do differently this year, having learned the lessons from those years? Well, first of all, I would say what we should do differently from the Met Office perspective and also what the public should do. Maybe I should take the latter first. The, we want the public to be more prepared in terms of Listen to the official source of weather information, Met Office, NADMA, as we work in conjunction, and take the necessary action. So what we have to do from the Met Office point of view, we have to make the message available 
and we have to make it in the simplest form uh, or format so that the public can understand. One of the things that the public the feedback we got with Ivan is that we never told them the storm was coming. We told them Grenada is under hurricane warning. But that is basically mean that you expect to be affected by a storm. So maybe they want it more plain language, the storm is coming. But we have to be more proactive, listen to them, and use all the means necessary. What we um hoping to do, or we started already from Ivan, we're giving the public a heads up. The complaint they had, they, had, they did not know the generation of Ivan, when it started. So what we are doing now, whenever we enter into the hurricane season, we are providing the public with an explain or simple version of the tropical weather outlook that we get from the hurricane center. The tropical weather outlook outlines areas of possible tropical cyclone development and how quick we expect it to develop. It might be within 24 hours up to five days. That is issued every six hours. So if we issue one at eight in the morning, the other will issue two in the afternoon, eight at night, and then two in the morning. So we're asking the public to listen to this announcement. Basically, we have them on all the media houses, the tropical weather outlook, and then they'll be guided by that. So the outlook will tell you within five days or 24 hours, we don't expect anything. Or it might be saying, there is a system with a likelihood, maybe a 20% chance of developing. So what you'll do, you'll listen for the next six hours, and then you'll get an update. It might move from 20% to 25 to 30. So then that level of awareness, we want it to become a, a household thing. Keep tuned. It's like when you listen to a good cricket match years ago, and you don't know Richard's century as yet. We want to know where the system is and what the system is doing. So that is what we intend to do better, make the message more available in simple language as possible. So Mr. McIntyre, coming back to you, based on what Mr. White would have just explained, how important is it for people to understand that there is no room for complacency? Because as he mentioned, they're making things easier, simpler for you to understand, so you have an idea what is happening from when and for how long. How important is it for people to understand that in the midst of all this, we cannot afford to be complacent, even though you might be thinking, okay, this is still far or it's not going to affect us. We still need to be prepared. Yes. I would like to compliment my colleague basically in the information dissemination process. That is critical. If you have information, you are able to take action. And I think one of the, the limitations within the whole process is the inability or in some cases the ability for people to access information but don't treat it the way it should be treated. I think one of the things people need to do is to be able to find the information, trust the source of the information, and in this case Mr. White mentioned the Met Services and the NADMA agency that people should rely on that particular information. It is very easy to become complacent when things are not happening, when the excitement isn't in the air, when there is a lull in terms of activities, we may have a below average, we may have an average season, we may even have a, a predicted beyond average, and then you may not have as the prediction indicated. And so when people see these things happen, they do not relate to the science and that it's predictions and it, can, it may or may not happen. It may happen to Grenada, it may not happen to Grenada. And so if the event did not happen in Grenada, people tend to go back, well, you know, it did not happen, it may not happen, let's do as normal. So it is, it is important for us, maybe more than the general public, to be on the ball, to stay on the game, and to ensure that the information that people require, that is provided. When the information is given, people need to act on it. We came from Hurricane Ivan in 2004, and people could be forgiven to an extent because there was a a lull for about 48 years, almost 40, 49 years, before we had something as severe as Hurricane Ivan, Janet in 1955. And so that lent itself to the area where people thought, well, we've gotten our share. And we saw the same thing coming back after 2004, 2005. Then we did not have too much significant impact since then. People tend to believe, well, the science said there's a return period and Grenada has gotten its fair share and it's unlikely. The bottom line is it doesn't take an overactive, a beyond average season to affect the economy or to affect lives. 
it just take one of those and even if we did not get an impact directly but just one of our islands one of the countries not of us get affected we could be impacted as well look at covid it can just spread the the impact from one could just spread to the other and it could really affect us so it is really really critically important for people to stay and follow the information follow the tracking process get excited about it make it a subject a family discussion to discuss the events the cyclones when they come through for the hurricane season make it a family discussion where is it now how do we track it get the grid references the coordinates etc and make it an event that the entire family could enjoy and at the same time have a level of preparedness beefed up Benightly, uh, so Mr. White, based on what Mr. McIntyre would have just said, we know that a lot of people are busy to disseminate information. They want to be first. Maybe they're trying to rack up likes, whatever, on social media. They use social media a lot for that. How can we get people to understand that this is something that could actually hurt us more than help us if you don't wait for the proper information and go through the proper channels? Of course, the Met Office and NADMA, you just post things. And then, of course, there are some people who believe it. And then there might be a situation where there's panic. How can we, is there anything we can do to, to quell that? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I think we should recognize the role of the social media. It's a very quick form of communication and it's a very exciting one. And it's the one that is trending with the young people particularly. But uh, the wrong information is very misleading. And then what we urge the social media to do, wait on the right information as soon as they get it from the main office and that much, spread it as wide as you could spread it. So the social media has a role to play, and we want them to play it properly. And one of the things that we, we maybe we get set back because of the, the pandemic, is that we want to get into the social media ourselves. The point is, if you don't spread it, the right thing, somebody will spread the wrong thing, and that's the problem. So we, NADMA, Met Office, we have to take the role in spreading information um, our website was done, still done, and we're hoping at the end of this month to launch our new site. So as soon as we get that up and running, we'll have it published so that everybody could go right onto the site. And our site will have a lot of links to, to other sites in the region, Met Office sites, for example, or Barbados and the others who are to the east of us. It's good to monitor the sites likewise. We also will have the radar network. We have a pretty good radar network in the Caribbean. So that will also be on the site and satellite weather, etc. And we'll, it's a fairly well populated site, hopefully. And we're also hoping for feedback from the others, even the people on the social media people give us a feedback on how we can improve it. So, as we said, communication is important. And if we don't get first to the ball, then somebody will do it. And we're urging the social media, hey, you are doing a good job if you publish the right information. Please wait on us. You'll get it. Feel free to publish it. Definitely. An important requirement during the season, hurricane season, is adequate shelter, Mr. McIntyre. What is the state of readiness of the shelters in Grenada? How many designated shelters do we have this year spread across Grenada and the sister islands? Okay, before I answer the, the shelter issue and the, the statistics or the numbers for shelters, let me just reiterate a point from Mr. White in terms of the use of social media and the information um, process or communication process. Because tropical cyclones produce a lengthy phase of warning, we should have limited or no deaths related to them. Because they, they give us ample time to prepare to warn off. So when people make use or they have access to social media information etc rather than using it negatively to criticize the system or otherwise use it as a means of preparing early warning yourselves mm -hmm. for the event and that is to say you would and you would try to figure out whether or not your house is good enough to to keep you and your family or if you would have to access the government available shelters and in in this light the shelter process is one that should not be taken lightly. I have always said that there is no place sweeter than home. There is no shelter better than your house. And if everyone takes the time to prepare a strong room, to build your house or to fortify your dwelling, 
to the point where you can withstand the average uh, tropical system, that is best. But it is a state responsibility to prepare shelters and to prepare for persons who are vulnerable, persons who may not be able to have the kind of a dwelling that is required or to withstand the elements. And so the shelter process has started for 2020. It is just about completing. There is just over 135 buildings identified for shelters. The number will possibly be a little bit more given the, the need for more shelters within the COVID environment. So the shelter process is spread around country. The reports have to be submitted. They have to be sifted through for corrective measures and those that has to be upgraded or enhanced, they will be done during that process. But it has been a very rigorous process. It happens every year and COVID-19 didn't make it easier for us in 2020. We have to factor in the issue of the guidelines to incorporate the social distancing the protocol. All of the factors relating to COVID-19 that is relative to construction sites, workplaces, etc. we have to incorporate that within our shelter. Uh, it means, therefore, that the capacities that we had for 2019, that has to be doubled or tripled in some cases because would require more space. And you could imagine the challenge we would have. In addition to that, we have to also identify separation or isolation buildings or units where if persons show symptoms or they may come down with some um, contagious disease or otherwise, they would have to be isolated from the general body. So there is a, a process that people have to follow. And so the appeal would be even now for us to have more assistance, more hands on deck. And this is why the request for volunteers has gone out so that in particular complementing the shelters I, we've never had full complements of staff for all shelters across country. This year we want to make a mark, we want to make a difference. And I can see that the interest from volunteers, it's really encouraging. And so I would want to be able to assign most of these volunteers to help us with the shelter support and help us to incorporate the safety guidelines relative to COVID-19. That is to say, uh, there will be staggered feeding, staggered bathing, there will be um, sanitation points or wash stations. People may have to go through checks, thermometer checks and so forth. We would have to um, have them either installed in those facilities or they would have to be with the health official to check persons as they come through. So it would it would be a rigorous process. So we'll be asking persons to prepare yourselves as if you, if you have to use the shelters, you're going out for a little time. So help the system. Face mask or face covering would be required your own hand sanitizer, sanitizers will also be required. So help the system. While the state have a responsibility to provide, but it will only complement and help if people take responsibility to, to provide these. And I want to put this point in here. It is not the generic or the produced sanitizers from distilleries or other places that is what is acceptable or is workable. Water and soap is as good. So we would advise persons to make use of water and soap. You don't need to be, you don't need to just have hand sanitizers to move around in bottles. But once soap and water is available, they serve as good as the bottled san hand sanitizers, and that would be a requirement for shelters. <laughs> Thank you. You actually answered my follow-up question. <laughs> so I'll go now to Mr. White. Um, earlier on, you mentioned about ensuring that things are made as simple as possible for the public to follow. We understand now that you have the color-coded forecast. Can you explain the significance of that for us and the advantages, again, in terms of helping the public to have a better understanding of maybe what some of the terms used by forecasters actually mean? Okay, that's something we new to us, but it's already established in most of the other islands. It is whole part of the impact forecasting project, and that is one of the requirements that is laid down in the Sandai frame of work and Grenada is signatory to that. Um, the forecast should be concentrating on not what the weather will be, but what the weather will do. In other words, if we say rain, the people out there want to know if they can put leave the laundry out, if they can leave the cuckoo out, or they have to bring it in. They want to know if they can go to work, if they cannot go to work, if they can work on a roof, if they can pour concrete. So there is different levels. Rain is not just rain. So that's why in, in the color code will take in intensity, whether it's moderate, it's heavy, it's intense, etc. And then we also will take on likelihood. 
the probability. So something might be of a very high intensity, but the likelihood that it will occur is very, very, very low. So there will be a different code for that. So the lowest code will be green. So if something is at a green level, basically it does not call for much action because of the, that. So at green, basically you will listen for further information. You become more aware of the surrounding. Then you move to orange. Basically the same thing to take very little action. Sorry, after green is yellow and then orange and the most intense is red. During the red, you take all action possible to save lives and property. And if you read anything from the Hurricane Center, very rarely use the word again property, but lives is the important thing. Lives matters, black or white. So, um, one of the things that was recently done by the World Bank, they came up with an estimate on life. And they put a human life in the region of 5 million US. That is very conservative. So imagine in, your, in a storm, a situation, a hurricane, you lost two people. Already look at your, da your damage here. Nobody thinking going to have a private house cost five million US dollars. Yeah. And the houses, your car, they are replaceable. And that's why part of disaster management too, and as the government side of it, you have to ensure that your insurance companies operating are operating with their insurance and they're operating above board so that people can get back or uh, get close to where there was in terms of the property. But the emphasis is life. And in disaster management, the slogan is one death is one too many. Yes. And that is why we have to take those sort of action. So we have come up with this color coding so you know what action to take. So we'll be putting that on the forecast and on the warning, but there will be an explanation so we will not be all lost. We was hoping to run a workshop um, sometime in May where that would have been explained, but you know, all this, a lot of changes have taken place and it's not possible. We're still looking at it next year where the color coding will be explained more fully. Another th thing I want to um, express too is the project that we need to have on now with a series of rainfall stations and automatic weather stations throughout the island, including Pity Martinic. And the one at Pity Martinic is very, 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 very important. The reason why, the Met Office is at the extreme south of Grenada, and Pity Martinic is our very furthest point. And many times we find that the government of Barbados, who is responsible for St. Vincent, will issue a hurricane or tropical storm warning for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And that gives us a responsibility to do a lot of monitoring in Pity Martinic in that case, because we may have to issue a similar warning for Pity Martinic, because very close to the St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we welcome that move, and the stations will be read at real time. They'll be looking at the river level, they'll be looking at um, wind, they'll be looking at rainfall, which is associated also with river level, and action will be taken based on this information. Through that program here, what I would like to urge people out there, you see those instruments close to the river, please do not tamper with them. There is one close to the Bonnet School that monitors the river there. There is one close to the Samaritan Police Station that monitors the river. We try to put some of them in areas where we'll have a bit of security. There is one at the Belmont Estate where they have the restaurant there. There is one somewhere on that bridge there. And throughout the island, they are located. And we'll get this information in real time. That project costs the government of Greenland in the excess of a million dollars. And this is to provide early warning for Grenada, Caracou, and Pity Martinic. We have some in St. John's from the Clojé water tank right down to the rivers. So we're looking at rainfall to the top of the hill and the river level. We also have monitoring the Baltaza River so that we can inform motorists. There's still some fine tuning to do on that project, but it's a very, very good project, and that is will increase our ability to provide early warning for Grenada, Carrico, and Pity Martin. Do you have a rough estimate as to how many of these stations you have across the island? Well, the total stations is about 33 stations, but 
um, we have what we call climate station, agromet station, water level stations, and synoptic station. The synoptic stations are what we call the complete stations. They will give you all the information from radiation to um, wind to rainfall, temperature, everything. And we have six of those synoptic stations. We have one at the airport. We have one in Cetez, close to Magnolia College. We have one in Kublal. We have one at Kariku and one at Piti Matnik. And then we have other stations, the Agromet station and the climate stations. We have distributed throughout the island as a network. The network would not be as, as how we want it, but what we have done is that the network, the network is more or less have to be in sync to what we call a secure location. So we find we have a lot of them on the um, now also treatment plant, Annidale, et cetera, et cetera, Pegasus, we have them there because we have a level of security there. So again, we are appealing to the public to not tamper with this equipment. They are very important and they are there to protect you and the money came from the taxpayers of Grenada. So there's no sense you trying to destroy what you have bought. Uh, uh, any problems with any of them so far yet? Have you had any? No, no. Years ago, we just started with the stations. We had one in Mali. That's where we have the monitoring station for Cape Town Journey. Someone is told the solar panel. We replaced it since then. And what we have done, Nadma, we have, we have chose to put a gate and lock the gate. Okay. So since then, we haven't had that. We have one at um, a bridge called Barrack Bridge, that's close to Brothers School, St. John's Christian Secondary School, and the old man there close to his home, he viewed the station as his, so <laughs> he monitored it, he don't let any children go and play with it, so <laughs> even surprisingly, the one at um, Florida Bridge, surprisingly, the children is aware of it, and whenever they go, they ask us questions about it, and they, they do their own little security. So, so far, so good. That's good. Mr. Mark, emergency operating centers, what's the importance of those in this time? The EOC or the emergency operating centers are the place where the activities are expected to be coordinated. And so there's a national EOC, it's called NEOC, that is based at Fort Frederick at the moment. And we do have three others across country. There is one in Black Bay, there's one in PT Martinique, and there's one in River Sally, St. Patrick. Apart from that, persons can establish sectors like health. They can establish centers where in the event you have a threat, people can come together to coordinate the event. And that is critical for any activity, that there is a coordinating mechanism where information would come in. It would be filtered, it would be um, dealt with action and sent back out and that is that is critically important those facilities are supposed to be built to withstand the harshest of weather conditions so it is a place that should be safe because once the system is activated people are expected to walk within there and to stay throughout until the all clear is given as a matter of fact until it goes through the recovery process or until life is back to normal and that is critically important. What I, I want to also have to mention the aspect of, you know, impact-based um, forecasting and so on. It is something that we welcome, Mr. White, something we are looking for. The general public would be happy, as he mentioned. It's not just about the rain, but what the rain will do. I, I think one of the calls we've been having is that this, they have been saying to us, you're going to say rain going to come. It may not even tell us how much rain we're getting and where it's going to be and what it is likely to cause. We are in a position where we are getting that together, and we have to congratulate the regional system and our local Met Office to be on, to be on par with that. The other thing about the, the color coding, it is critical because it is comprehensive disaster management, and the color coding complements what we do nationally, regionally. I think it's international sort of, but I know for sure the region We've been embarking on the, the green, the yellow, the, the orange, and the red. It's a similar warning system we have for tsunamis. It's a similar system we have for the Kikam Jenny monitoring system. So the, the color coding becomes consistent across board. So when people understand that it is at green, they know it is kind of a okay, it's good. 
when it gets to to yellow, you would understand that something is beginning to happen. When it gets to to the to the orange, well, things are getting bad, and when it gets to red, you know that it is bad. And so, even the Kikam journey, as we speak, we've had some increased activities within the last couple of days at Kikam journey. We've had some tremors there and so on. Not significant, but the alert level still remains on yellow. So, and it has been on yellow because Kikam journey has always been active. It has never been on green since I've known it. Since it started in 1939, it moved um, and has always been on yellow, meaning that it is totally active. It's always active. And we're hoping that the elevation does not really change. But recently, we've had some reason to monitor more closely in the event that things change there. So the, the color coding is really critical. It becomes standard across board, so now people will understand that when they are under, they hear a system is coming, this is where we are, this is the likely impact of what is happening, then they have a better appreciation as to what it can cause for lives. Definitely. Let us talk, Mr. McIntyre, a bit about the regional capacity and how that ties in with the national capacity and at what stage might Grenada require regional assistance? This is really important for everybody to understand. We work as a region and Mr. White would want to chip in here in terms of the meteorological connection as well as how that warning process will happen. So we have the meteorological warning system that incorporates the region. Grenada, Trinidad, etc. And he mentioned Barbados, St. Vincent, and then P.T. Martinic in the process. So Grenada is part of what is called the Sidima states. There are 19 states that form that system. So we, we're not left alone. We all in this together, we, we operate on similar operating principles, and we depend on the technical and material support from each other. So if Grenada is impacted, we are expected to be assisted from any of the 19 countries directly within the region. There's an arrangement. There's not a lot of bureaucracy to clear to get assistance with that is concerned. So that mechanism coordinated out of Barbados, Sidima's headquarter, they would provide the technical support. And if there is a, a country where that they are so badly hit, another country will assume coordinating responsibility on behalf of. So the region is divided into four quadrants, and Grenada being the southern, and um, Trinidad being um, the focal point for Grenada. So if, if Grenada is affected seriously, Trinidad would, would coordinate on behalf of Grenada until Grenada gets its capacity up. Similarly, if Trinidad has a problem, Grenada, Suriname, or Guyana would be done in this southern zone, would take up the activities. So it's a really, really organized system of assistance that is, it is called the regional response mechanism where resources, technical or otherwise, is mobilized. And it goes as far north as the Bahamas, and it goes as far south as, as Suriname. Recently, we've had other countries joining in, like um, St. Martin and the Dutch Antilles, etc. They have been joining the system. So if we have a problem, Grenada can get assistance, and we can, like we've done for Oma and Maria and Dorian in 2018, was it? where we were able to, to send support to us, uh, 19 actually. Dorian was in 2019, the Bahamas was badly hit. And so Grenada had to have given them some level of support. So we, there is that system of support that exists. And so we want people to know that even our technical experts, regular persons who have, a, have um, the ability to assist, they are sometimes called upon. So every year, Sidima would ask for different persons who can be on standby in the event that they needed to assist that those persons can be called up so and that is a regional arrangement so mr white um just chip in and tell us about the, the connection as mr mcintyre would have said uh, mr mcintyre would have mentioned that oh yeah right so yeah, yeah the region the um, met office perspective there's also a regi regional arrangement grenada is located in the world in region four so within region four region four is the united states basically the atlantic ocean the caribbean and you know that's where a lot of the hurricane occur. So what we find that every year there is a meeting um, of members of Region 4, the Hurricane Committee meeting. Unfortunately, this year was not able to meet for obvious reasons. When that meeting um, in that region, the Hurricane Center is normally highly involved. I was privileged to attend that meeting on two occasions, although we are not members of WMO. And one of the things in terms of the coordinating mechanism just sometime while at the meeting, I get I receive a phone call or email. They want Mr. McIntyre's number. So in terms of coordination, the director of the Hurricane Center 
has Mr. McIntyre's number, has my number, the number at the Met Office, the Director of Operation, which is really the technical person at the airport. And every year they review, review that number. In terms of the hurricane planning arrangement, we have countries like Antigua, responsible for most of the small islands to the north, St. Keats, etc., etc., Anguilla. Then we have St. Lucia is responsible for themselves in issuing warning. Then we have Barbados is issuing warning for Barbados, St. Vincent, and Dominica. And we have Grenada responsible for Grenada, Tobago. Sorry, Trinidad responsible for Grenada, Tobago, and themselves. And if um, there is a problem in Trinidad, Barbados will take over the responsibility, etc. So one of the things that we do before we issue a warning for Grenada, there's a bit of coordination between a senior person at the Met Office. It doesn't have to be me, but it could be the senior person on duty at that time, along with the senior person in Trinidad, and they will coordinate. They think it's right to place Grenada on the warning. They will call the director of the Hurricane Center and discuss it, and it says, bingo. Grenada will be on the warning. If for some reason Trinidad doesn't see it fit, not Grenada see it fit, the director of the Hurricane Center, if they see it fit, they will call. They will call and recommend that Grenada is placed on the warning. And we have to say that because you cannot insist to put a country on the warning. Because a warning really is the forte of the Minister of National Security. So in all of that, we always have to keep the Prime Minister or whoever he designates in contact. So beyond the scenes, a lot of discussion has been taking place before we could put Grenada on the warning. Because the Prime Minister then, when he gets that information, have to go to the Governor General to do the read in case you have to declare school closed. We can't do it for oneself. So this is even what we want the, the um, social media people to understand. It takes time. It doesn't get up and say, whoop, warning. No. There is a process. And it's a regional process. We have to satisfy the local criteria. We work with our government, work with the NEAC and NADMA before warning is issued. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that uh, information. All right, so gentlemen, we're running out of time. So I'll give you a minute each to say any final words you may have. I'll start with you, Mr. Mark. Yes. So in uh, 30 seconds, maybe 40, I would just want to... Um, reiterate how it's going to happen in the event that I did not have this opportunity to come back and say what will happen hurricane season. So once there is a threat, the Met Office would, would warn us off at NADMA. They would tell us the Greek reference and we would disseminate this process to the general public. What the public is required to do is to act on this information and look to see what do I need to do, what is or how that will affect me. The situation increases where it becomes a watch. We again disseminate it and Met will give us regular bulletins and we would inform the public. The media in this instance, because there's a break between those 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 advisory or, or, or those bulletins, the media we are expecting social media and the regular media houses to inform the public. Unless something has changed, there will be no information in between. You would wait until the next one come. And sometimes people are apprehensive that they have not heard anything. Once it gets to the point where it is a warning. More likely than not, Grenada will get affected by some system. This is the almost the crunch period. This is the 36 hours before we actually get impacted. This is where people need to make the final preparation that I have to go in, not during the system, but before it actually impacts. If you have to go to shelter, you go through it. Finally, the National Disaster Management Agency, working in collaboration with MET, with MET has endeavored is endeavoring to give the information within the shortest possible time and as correct as it should be. We would hope that persons will understand this process. It may not come as quick as they expect, but when it comes, it has to be the right thing that people can act on. Definitely. Mr. White? Yes, thank you. My final word for select to mention my staff. I believe I'm, my staff is at the highest level it ever has been both in quantity and in quality. Hard work and staff and rely on them a lot. They have been doing a good job and they're enthusiastic and ready to go. We know this time of the year is the time of action in terms of tropical cyclone and all airs will be tuned to the Met Office. Be advised that we are around the clock, 24 hours a day, and we just hope that whenever we have information, we get the right personnel to pass it to so that the information can be um, disseminated. And of course, with 
we, we need the confidence of the of the public too. And the public will understand that sometimes we make a forecast and not the focus is not really wrong, but sometimes nature chooses to behave otherwise and sometimes we get a licking for that. But the science is not perfect. Be advised that at the Met office we are trying our very best. I hope people can understand that because, yeah, you know, a lot of times they complain. You say it's going to rain, there's no rain, or vice versa. I hope people could understand that. But also, in terms of the forecast, we do a forecast for Green and Carico and Pity Martinic. So, when somebody in Pity Martinic say, Oh, the forecast is raining, they didn't get advised them there was raining in Granite Town. Oh. <laughs> you can't be everywhere. <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen. It has been a pleasure. I know you're very busy, and I do appreciate you coming. So we've been speaking with Mr. Sylvan McIntyre. He is the Acting Disaster Coordinator at the National Disaster Management Agency, NADMA, and Mr. Hubert White, the Manager of Meteorology. And, of course, as I mentioned at the start of the program, this is the first in a series, Preparedness is Key, as we look at the importance of disaster preparedness, not just during the hurricane season, but in, as a way of life. I am Leslie Ann Johnson. Thank you so much for viewing.